Welcome back for the fourth and final video for chapter one. This video is important and it's likely to be a little longer than the others because we're going to talk about the process of developing a program. First, we want to talk about what, prog what elements programs typically always have. And there's really three types of elements. One is an input section where we read inputs. There's a process section where we do calculations. Then there's an output section where you display the results. And we can see this very quickly in our old friend from the lab, Add 3. Because we are reading inputs, we're doing a calculation, we're displaying the outputs. Now what is the programming process? Here are the steps in the programming process. First step is to define what the program is going to do. And another way of saying this is understanding what the program is required to do. The second is visualizing what the program will look like when it's actually running. That simply means design the interaction or the dialogue between the program and the person that's using the program. We'll see what that means shortly. Step three is where you uh, will sketch out what you think the steps are for solving the problem. And there are devices for doing it, such as certain diagramming techniques or what we call pseudocode, which is just a, a, a simple set of steps that we use. After which, we actually write the code in C++. Notice that by the time we get to step Five, we should be totally clear about what the program is going to do. All right, so that writing the code will simply implement what we have produced in section three. As we write the code, we compile it. Uh, it is possible that the program will not compile because we have language errors in the code, such as syntax errors. Uh, once we get past um, syntax errors, the program can be compiled and linked to produce an executable file, which can then, at step 9, be run. And then you can check to see that the outputs match what you expect the outputs to be. Need to go back a page. Uh, a critical part of step number 1 is making up two or three or four examples of instances of where the program would be used. And for each example, use real data and go through the calculations that are required so you can say, if I'm given this real input data, this ex is exactly the output I would expect to see. So let's go, and the last part is when you're all done, go back to the original description of the program and make sure that what you have implemented satisfies that. This process is called software testing, which is a specialized career path, which is very important for software companies. So let's go through these steps. Step one, define what the program is going to do. We're going to use an example of calculating income tax, given the amount of income and a tax rate. So let's make some examples. Well, suppose the tax rate is 10% and the income is 10000 We would expect the tax to be $1,000. Uh, suppose the tax rate is zero and the income is 40 We expect tax to be zero. Is it reasonable to say tax rate is zero? Yeah, if you live in Florida, Texas, and other states, yes, it makes sense. And finally, Get a little more complicated if the tax rate is 1.5% and the income is 500 you would expect um, a tax to be merely $7.50. Second part, now this is also critical. Uh, there are some rules of the road that I want to share with you uh, for step two. When you visualize the program running, you basically are saying, how does the program ask for inputs? And we, the first rule of etiquette, it's called input etiquette, always ask for your inputs in a clear way. So if the program displays on the screen, enter income, 
then the user will know I want to type in the income. Um, the request for input is called a prompt. We're prompting for input. What about tax rate? Hmm. Well, tax rate is a percent, and how can we represent percents? Well, we can represent percents as whole numbers. 5% is the number 5. Or we could do it as um, fractions. We can say 5% is 0 0.05. So it does matter how you enter the tax rate. So if I simply ask for ta tax rate, that's not good. If I say tax rate is somewhere between 0 and 100, then a person can say, aha, I can put on, if it's 5%, I should say 5.0. If, if we say this, they may have a feel, feeling that the tax rate is between 0 and 1, so 50% so would be 0.5. And what about the last one? This is actually best. Here you're saying if the rate is 5%, display it in fraction form. So you've helped the user. So there's lots of ways to ask for input. Some ways are better than others. Uh, there's a rule that you got to be aware of. It's called GIGO. Garbage in, garbage out. If the person mistakenly enters the wrong tax rate, if you expected a fraction, 0.05, and they put in 5, what's the tax rate? It's 500%, not 5%. So uh, a good prompt will avoid prevent garbage coming in. Second question, how does the program display its outputs? Etiquette is still required. In the case where the tax was $7.50, if you just dump out $7.50, um, that's lacking because you must clarify what each output stands for. So it would be better to say the tax is $7.50 instead of the number $7.50. We call that labeling the output. Step three. Use some tool or notation to create a model of the program. Okay, I've shown you a model. Earlier I said normally a program has inputs followed by processing followed by output. We call that the IPO model. So if that's the case, steps one and two represent I, input. Step three is processing. Step four is output. So we can informally say, I want to read a tax rate because it's an input. Read income. Calculate the tax using a formula and display the amount of the tax. All right? Step number four says check the model for logical errors. What does that mean? Take the examples you did in step one and go through the steps of reading of following these steps based on the inputs that you have for for uh, step one and you should produce the same result now we're ready to write some code now notice a couple things in our inputs we kind of identify quantities that are inputs, like input and tax rate. What do we know about our program? Well, all inputs must go into variables. Therefore, we need a variable for income and we need a variable for tax rate. The output that we calculate right here, tax, it needs to be stored also, so we need a variable for that. So when we start writing the program, we must identify variables for inputs and outputs. Um, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. First thing to note, and, and this should provide you some comfort, is that all programs start from the same origin. All programs start off like this. These are standard things that always have to be present in red. The, that, that's what I call the standard program shell. And it's a starter. And inside, we can say, aha, there's a place where the declarations go. There's a place where reading the inputs go. There's a place where performing calculations go. There's a place where I display my outputs. So these are like placeholders to say, put your variables here. Put your input here. Put your calculations here. Put your output statements there. All right. So when we talk about variables, variables 
to serve different purposes and um, are used for different purposes. In the case of this problem, we're dealing with decimal numbers. So we need to be aware of the type of value, type of variable that we need. Variables like have different colors, uh, like different color marbles. We have variables that hold whole numbers. We have variables that hold strings. We have variables that hold single characters. We have variables that hold decimal numbers. And each one has a different type. So the type of variable, we would call it a decimal, but in C++ it's a float. But we need to be reminded of what, how do you declare a variable. And you declare a variable by saying what its type is, followed by the name of the variable. So up here, for example, we're declaring a variable called num. What about num? It's of type int. What does comma mean? It's punctuation. It says, I'm continuing with declaring things. So num2. What's this type int? I'm continuing. The comma says I'm continuing. So what's the data type? It's an integer. So I'm declaring, in this case, four integer variables, num1, num2, num3, and total. So that's how you declare the variables. We know how to do the input statements with the prompts. So let me sh show you. Um, here's where we're reading inputs. Here is where we do the reading. We're reading a value. This says read a value for num1. This says read a value for num2. Notice that, I'm, that I have highlighted two things. The greater greater is called what? The input operator. There's a name for it we'll talk about later. Followed by a variable. This says read a value into this variable here. But before we do the reading, etiquette says what? Always ask for the inputs before you read them. So this line, line 35, is called a prompt. Okay? Let's look at outputs. The answer that we want is called total. Do we just dump total on the screen? No, it is preceded by this description. Sum of three values equal. What I have highlighted, we call that what? An output label. So we're labeling the output. We're prompting for the input. Right. That's what the etiquette tells us. Uh, when we do the calculations, the calculations look, look like algebraic formulas. Calculation here looks like an algebraic formula. If you did not have the semicolon here, you would say this is just algebra, this is just algebra. The moment you put a semicolon here, you're saying this is a statement in C++. Alright? Now, and I think with that we're pretty much done because the rest of this, step 6, 7, 8 through 11, you can do that on your own. And I encourage you to work on this one problem, and we'll probably do a little bit with it in the lab. But go ahead and work on it so you get the hang of what we've just discussed. That concludes the uh, videos for chapter.